a lot of people, they're just letting other people design their life and they're not getting clear about their values and who they want to be. And then they're not intentional. And then they're walking around feeling unfulfilled. And that is why. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm really excited to have Angela Barnard with us today. Angela is a very talented person that helps people get in alignment with what they want to do to design their life. And we're going to talk about that today and really look at how you can make sure that you're not living off of somebody else's roadmap, somebody else's dreams, that you're really aligned with what's most important to you. Thank you so much for joining me today, Angela. Thanks, Wade. I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. So one of the things that you and I talked about uh, in our pre-interview, which was really interesting to me, was just this idea of not just being in alignment, but really being intentional about things. And we both discussed different authors we've read, and you know that word can be used a lot of different ways of being intentional. What does that look like for you when you're working with your clients and they're intentional, they're aligned? How does that feel for that person and what does that look like? Well, let's talk about the the whole definition of intentional. Like you just said, like it can mean a lot of different things to people. So what being intentional means to me is that I am my actions and my habits and my thoughts are in alignment with who I want to be. So if I say that I want to be a healthy person, I think like a healthy person. I have the habits of a healthy person. A lot of us are living out of alignment with what it is that we truly desire. And that's what I think it means to be intentional is when you get those thoughts and those habits in alignment. And for my clients, what that looks like is like, let's say I work with a lot of people that are in jobs where they feel like really unfulfilled in those roles. And they're coming to me trying to get clarity around what it is that they want to do. What are their next steps? And my first thing is like, who do you want to be? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have? What are your values? And then we're going to work on getting the environment and their habits and all of that stuff within alignment with their greater vision. So I really think all of being intentional starts with having a vision of who you want to be and how you want to live. Awesome. Thank you. And one of the things that also gets used a lot. We've we've both heard this word vision. We've probably done, you and I have both probably done a lot of vision work in our time of what it's going to look like and how it can be. And I think a lot of people, when they hear about that, they say, oh, okay, this vision again. It's like back in the 80s and 90s, it's your vision and then what it's going to look like and your why. And after a while, if there's not a lot of substance behind it, it can sound kind of fluffy. I know coming from the corporate background, it almost sounded like, oh gosh, they're talking about vision in Michigan. This is where they try to get us to buy into something that's not in necessarily alignment with me. It's you know for the company or whatever it might be, as opposed to what I'm looking to do. And even when I talk with entrepreneurs or individuals in a personal growth setting or in a life coaching situation where it's just about them, we've you know taken all other people out of the equation, at least hypothetically, there's still this sense of, well, this vision, it's kind of a fluffy thing. Mm-hmm. What is it that requires, you You mentioned action. And again, most people know, okay, I've got to act on my vision. What does that look like with a client that, let's say, is struggling when they come to you where they, maybe they do have a vision. They've done some work. They're like, I, you know, I've got my vision board. I've got a map. I've got cut out pictures from a magazine. I really do believe in this. I buy into this. I, I'm open to doing this. But it's not happening. And not in the sense that I'm sitting around doing nothing. I think most of us are pretty clear. If you do nothing, the vision's not going to mm-hmm. happen. But they're kind of struggling to to get clear of what that action looks like. Or, hey, I've been working on this, Angel. Why is it not happening? Why am I not there yet? How would you advise that person? Or, or what does that look like when they're starting and when they're starting to make progress in the direction of them you know, making that happen the way they want? Yeah. So I think um, there is, so going back to the beginning of what you said is like, sometimes there's this perception that having a vision or you're thinking of a vision board or whatever, that seems like too out there. Like you've heard it before and you're kind of like, yeah, what's that really going to do for me? Cause I know that I need to be taking action. So I think sometimes there's resistance to spending time com- becoming clear around the vision because they feel like I immediately need to start taking action. So when I teach around visioning, um, 
I really bring in how the mind works and how the mind likes to have a vision, likes to have a plan and an intention. And a lot of times people think, well, I'm already clear around what it is that I want. Like, I know I want to, I want to get out of my job. I hate this job. I want, I want to be an entrepreneur, but they, they haven't, they don't know a lot about how the mind works in relation to making that goal of theirs an actual reality. A lot of times they get wrapped up in the results part of it. Like they'll be like, well, I want to have um, a business that makes X amount of dollars, right? And they forget that for you to have that result, you need to be a certain kind of person with a certain ki- with a certain kinds of habits with thoughts. And that's the real work when I talk about visioning is getting clear about who do you need to be? What kind of person and what are the habits that person has? So when someone is not achieving the results that they want, what I find is that I say that they don't have, they're not using the recipe that leads to those results. And that's mental programming and habits. So when I help people set goals and have a clear vision, we talk a lot about how the mind actually works. And I talk about how when you set goals, instead of making them all results based, you make them identity based because that most of the results that we have come from a subconscious place. 95% of everything that happens, some listeners probably heard this before, come from the subconscious, 5% from the conscious. So I find people come to me working really in the conscious mind where they're like, I want this, I have this desire, I have this goal, but they forget that the real work happens in the subconscious. So if they're not creating the results, it's because the habits, their identity, there's something about them that probably doesn't truly believe that they are that person or they can be that person and they don't have the habits of that person. This is super simple. I always talk about weight loss examples because people can, their brains can really grasp this. But let's say that someone really wants to lose weight and they're like, I'm not, you know, I'm not losing weight. I've been doing all these things. Or... Or honestly, if you looked at these people's habits, a lot of times they don't have the habits of a healthy person. They don't think like a healthy person. And if they're only, if it's, they're acting like a healthy person, short, maybe it's very, it's going to be very short lived unless the mental programming comes along with that. That makes sense. So I'm seeing with a lot of my clients that they come to me saying like, I don't even need to spend time on visioning work. I don't need to spend time on getting clear on that because you know what? I already know what it is, the results that I want, but I need to help them more with getting clear around the identity and the habits they need. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And there's a, there's a couple things that you said that I think are really important to look at is number one, habits. So I happen to be a person that's been married. So, my, so is my wife for, for 17 years. <laughs> and I've sometimes had people say, well, how do you stay married? And part of it's a beingness thing. I'm a person committed to being married. Now, that's not a knock. There's other people who are committed to being married that still, it doesn't work out for various reasons. But when I look at a habit, you, know, you hear about habits like, you know, don't go to bed angry. And I, I wish I could say that we've always kept to that. That's not true. But there's a habit that I have that I think I got from my parents or somewhere in between. They're still married. Um, and I'd say happily married too, but there's also moments where they're not as happy and they're still married. So it's not always, you know, every single moment of bliss, but this idea of being a person, the habit is that I'm always looking to, how can I get back into alignment with the relationship? How can I get back into a good place? So again, we'll have stumbles, we'll have arguments, we'll have different mm-hmm. things like any other relationship, but then Right after that, right when kind of come out of that temporary sense of either frustration or just kind of losing center. When I come back to center, it's like, oh, what am I committed to? And it's not it's not even like it's said. It's, oh, that's the habit. And so the habit is there. And it's not so much that I have this, I've not played out this long-term vision of every moment of what it looks like. I want to be happily married to my wife. Great. It's, it, you know, so for me, that's a very simple concept. But when it looks different ways, I think we're both willing to say, okay, that's our original vision. And so that habit of, okay, we're still, we almost know, and it's almost even a little safer to say, okay, I'm going to really say what I feel. I'm really frustrated right now, but there's that habit that we're coming back to the relationship. Uh, and and there's also a habit that we're, we're, we're gentle with each other most of the time and we're respectful to each other overwhelmingly mm-hmm. majority of the time. And so I think that makes it easier. And so sometimes the other part, 
and I, I'd ask for your clarification on this because I think some people, to your point, get caught up in the vision, but whether you want to call it the actions, the habits, they're not envisioning, I remember hearing a sports coach saying yeah. this, they're not envisioning the practice that's going to get them there, let's say, or the exercises. What is that and how does that tie in with the habits? Oh, I love that because that's what I was trying to get at is that a lot of times people will say they know what they want, but they don't know what's in, what recipe, I call it a recipe, to get to where they want to go, like the stuff that will actually get them there. And I think it's more important that you get clear on the habits that you need. You decide what kind of person you, you want to be, and you get more clear on the habits. That way you can see yourself doing those things and being, keyword here, being that person. A lot of times people live their life from this backwards way of thinking. They think like, when I have that, then I'll act that way. But how it actually works is you act like the person you want to be now, and that creates the results that you want to have. And what's really cool about this is this is how the mind works. The, the mind, if you think about 95% of everything we do and all the decisions we make is subconscious, it's identity based. So if you tell yourself in your mind, I want to be this person, just like you said, Wade, you said, you know, I want, I want to be the person that is happily married. And if you think right now, I am a person that is happily married, then I show up this way. Then when things get hard, what I do is we lean into it. We talk about it. And that's what creates the results of the happy marriage that I want to have. If you were thinking, I'll act like a happily married man when we actually have a happy marriage, then I'll start acting that way. Like that, you're not going to have a happy marriage or it's going to be very short lived. Like if you do have it, it's going to be gone pretty quickly, you know? So the best thing to do is to start with identity first. Think about who, like if you were this person already, the kind of person you want to be, like let's go to entrepreneurship. If you were already the kind of entrepreneur that you want to be, how would you show up every day? Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't have the results that you want, it is because you don't have the mental programming and the habits of the kind of person you want to be. So the work that needs to be done is to figure out what are the what's the mental programming. Very important because the mental programming, the, the things that you're thinking will lead to the habits that you perform. So if what I advise people to do is to get clear the kind of person they want to be. Let's say you want to be some kind of entrepreneur. Pick an entrepreneur that you really admire and that you like, how they're living their life. I want you to listen to how they talk, what they actually say, because that is evidence of what they believe. And then pay attention to their habits. And a lot of times they teach you their habits, which is really awesome. If you adopt those beliefs, and I, there's different ways that you can in a sense, program your mind to believe the things that they believe because we're all we're all getting programmed all day long from all the things, our environments, that's what marketing does. It tries to program us to take a certain action. So what I like to say is instead of letting other people program you, you program you. You get intentional about who you want to be. You tell yourself those thoughts because there's three ways that you can, you can program. Um, you can program through repetition. I'll just talk about one of them real quick. So if you repeat to yourself the things that you want to believe, like the kind of person you want to be would believe. I'm like, I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of people that I admire that have businesses that I'm just like, that live a life where they get to travel. They have all this freedom. They have um, passive income coming in. And you know, everyone that's listening, like you want a life like that. And I, I've seen a commonality between how they think. They tend to say things like this, that everything is happening for them. They have that belief, that abundance kind of mindset. They adapt that that things are an opportunity for them. Even when they're afraid to do something, they show up, they see it as an opportunity for them to learn and grow. Um, they believe that every little bit counts. They honor their time in their calendar. These are, men these are mental programs that they have. It leads to certain habits. Like if I believe I honor my time in calendar, that means, first of all, I, I put stuff into the calendar that's important to me. So that's an example of that. And that's a habit that I have every day. Maybe they're they plan their day out, um, they do evaluation, and then it leads to, leads to what? It leads to the business that they have. So that's what I'm talking about when it comes to being intentional is, is figuring out what is that recipe that you need and what's a part of that? What are the ingredients for you? It's kind of like if you want to make a cake, 
you got to figure out what are the specific ingredients that will make that cake. And I like to think about it as mental programming and habits. And the ingredients will be different depending on the kind of cake that you want to make. Great. Thank you. And one of the things that I think is so important, I'd like your thoughts on this, is a lot of people are crystal clear on the vision. I, I know what I want it to look like. And then in a lot of coaching, I do this too. We talk about, okay, you know, what would you need to do to make that happen? Actions, what would that look like? And a lot of people get stuck in the planning phase mm -hmm. as opposed to starting doing something. And so I'll, I'll say maybe a distinction here. They're waiting for the perfect plan versus starting perhaps the habit of doing something. So for example, one of the things I learned with having a three-day weekend is obviously uh, there's different levels of three-day weekends of how awesome they are. One, you know, you, you rode a private jet because somebody invited you and, you know, you were there and then, I don't know, just all these things happen. And then there's just really, well, I just had a chill, you know, three-day weekend, but I got to relax. And for me, the habit was to put something in my calendar on Friday that was worth doing and to, in co combination with that, to then, if that was important enough, to then finish up on Thursday, whether it was Thursday at midnight, Thursday technically, maybe even a little bit after midnight, but to say in my mind, okay, Thursday's done, I'm going to Friday. The action plan wasn't perfect, and the action plan has changed, but I find so many people get caught up on the action plan. They say, well, I'm not going to implement to have the perfect action plan. And so I think there's, to borrow your concept of recipe, I think sometimes people think, okay, but it's got to be the exact, exact formula as if there's mm -hmm. only one way to bake a cake as opposed to, you know, there's how I bake a cake. There's how you bake a cake. Yep. And there's some commonalities, but it's not, it's not a, a chemical experiment where if you get one little, you know, neutron or whatever wrong, that the whole world's <laughs> going to explode. It's, it's a progress thing. And I find so many people get paralyzed because it's not yet perfect. How do you help people with that? And, and what, what could you share on that that might help some of our listeners? That's a really great question. So, so many do get wrapped up in like, even when we talk about habits, like what are the specific things and like they obsess about that and they're like, oh, I can't be, then they start making up stories how they can't act that way because of whatever. And that stuff holds them back. What I like to say is just even when it comes to the goals, like sometimes people or the vision, they spend too much time obsessing about like the wording of it and all that thing, just break, bring it back to one identity that you want to have one identity. And if it's, if it's the entrepreneur that has freedom, so you can even just be like an entrepreneur that, you know, or a successful entrepreneur. And some people be like, well, that's too broad, but in your own mind, you have an idea of what that means to you. So that's already there. There's already images popping up in your mind when you say that. Now think today, if I am already a successful entrepreneur, how would I show up today? And it could be as simple as like, I create content. A successful entrepreneur creates content or creates products or services that help other people. So what can I create and start working on today that will help someone else? That seems broad, It doesn't, but it's just owning that identity. And as James Clear would say in his book, Atomic Habits, it's about Every action you take is a vote for who you want to become. So thinking about today, how can I vote to become the kind of person that I want to become? And it's all like those small things, they matter so much because it's going to lead to big things. You know, um, I tell a lot of people that don't have a, an exercise routine going for them that they're proud of. I say, one, adopt this belief that every little bit counts. Hold on to that belief because the people you want to be like, they have that belief. So hold on to that one. And then if every little bit counts and you're a person that is healthy, what do you do? Like you, you move your body every day. And maybe that your idea of the healthy person is working out for two hours or whatever is your idea of a healthy person. But simplify that just to the fact that they move their body every day and start moving your body every day. Be the person who does move their body every day. And if you do it for even five minutes, and a lot of times people say, well, what's five minutes gonna do for me? What it's gonna do for you, it's gonna train your mind that you are the person that moves their body. So that's what I mean by like, you can simplify it into a smaller thing and start to take those votes and it just will start building up. And I kind of think about it as like, when you're building like a snowman, you start with your little ball and then, you start small there, right? And you just start adding to it.
But when, wherever you're starting, it has to be a habit that the person that you would want to be actually would have. Even if it's a simplified version of their habit, it has to be some kind of habit. Like eventually, if you want to get to the point of having a stellar morning routine where you get to really have that time for yourself, you move your body, your journal, you work on the thing that's important to you, but you're coming from having no routine, like, well, we all have routines, but waking up and then rushing, that's the habit that you're in. I would not advise someone like that to try to be doing a two hour morning routine when you're coming from zero. What you need to focus on more is actually being the person that has an intentional morning routine. And if it's five, five and five, like 15 minutes of movement or it's five minutes of movement, five minutes of mindfulness, five minutes of writing down what you're going to do that day. Cool. Because start there, because now we're programming the habit. And then after you, you keep showing up that way, you start to, in a sense, train your brain and tell your brain that you are this kind of person. That's the real issue that people have. It's the identity issue. It's not so much the habits, but that what the habit does is it allows us to program our minds. Anything that we do in repetition, I say whatever you practice, you get really good at. So anything you do in repetition, in a sense, what you're doing is you are training yourself to be a certain kind of person. All of us are. Some of us are continuing to practice habits that are not in alignment with who we want to be. And then what we're doing is we're training ourselves to be a person that we don't want to be. And a lot of us are getting really good at, because whatever you practice, you get really good at. So you're getting good at becoming that version that you don't want to be. Like if you are eating unhealthy repeatedly over and over, you're getting really good at it. You are training yourself to be the person that is unhealthy. So the question I would ask yourself is, who am I training to be? Awesome. And one of the things that I think comes up for people around this is, the best way I can consider is, I'll, I'll use this term, there seems to be, at least for me, this identity hierarchy. So for example, my desire to be the best husband and father I can is at a higher level, commitment level than my desire to be the most fit athlete I can. I'm committed mm -hmm. to both, but if I have to choose between what's going to support my family versus what's going to get me a six pack, I'll support my family. And I know the two are not mutually exclusive. But it, for example, if on a certain morning, let's say I, I have a workout uh, scheduled or whatnot, but something comes up in the family, something on, you know, life happens, things aren't as intended, I I know what I'll go to. And again, it, it, you know, think of it, you said that word identity, it's a stronger identity, it's a stronger pull, it's a stronger commitment, I value it more. Mm -hmm. And I think what could definitely help people that we're, we're talking to here. And, 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 and for me too, I'd be curious your take on what's the difference between being intentional versus white knuckling it versus being like, no, it has to be this way, being so attached that if it, you know, mm. getting too precise in a vision, because I think a lot of people sometimes say, well, I, I visioned it, envisioned it this way. I saw it this way. Um, I even think of relationships. Well, you know, the person I'm going to either be in a relationship with or get married to, they're going to be this, 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 this. And it's like, whoa, um, maybe it'll happen that m way. Maybe it won't. How can we be intentional and committed and have these habits and yet still be open enough that there's room for life? There's room for, uh, if you believe in divine inspiration, there's room for, hey, synchronicity, whatever it might be. How can people do that in a way that serves them so that they're not going off track, but they're still going to that main area that they're looking to be? In other words, being good enough to say or, or, or aligned enough to say, yes, I'm going in this direction and I believe it looks like this, but if something comes along that's even more aligned, that I can actually be open enough to see that as opposed to say, nope, 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 I've got my blinders on, I'm going here, uh, and maybe I even miss out on an opportunity for what was my, my true goal, my actually mm -hmm. more core uh, intention. So I just wrote down um, and circled this word aligned. So you said earlier, what I help people do is really be more in alignment with who they want to be. So when you think of the word aligned, like being in alignment is how do you know you're in alignment based on how you feel? Your GPS is your in like it's in your internal, you know, the feelings is your internal GPS is what I'm trying to say. So anyways, if if you're feeling like, let's say, um, off about something or down or drained, that's an indication that you're out of alignment. 
But one of the thoughts that I love to hold on to because it makes me feel in alignment is this. I'm intentional, but I'm unattached. So I'm still intentional about what I want to create in my life. I still am intentional about how, how my day goes, but I'm not attached. When I start getting attached and it's be like, it has to be this way, it feels off. It feels like I'm forcing something. That doesn't feel like alignment. That's not what any of us want to feel like. So adopting that belief, I'm intentional, but I'm unattached, will serve you. Then you talked about this hierarchy around your identity, like let's call them identity-based goals. Like you have this hierarchy, like one is a little more important to you and maybe one is not as important. What I like to do with people when they feel like people come to me and they say that they're clear, I'm telling you the number one challenge I've seen with people is that they're not as clear as they think they are um, because they're not in thinking about this as a whole, like the whole recipe. Um, and it's hard because if you're not thinking about it in this way, you will continue to self-sabotage and you will continue to not get the results that you want until you consider all of this, the be, act, have component, all of that stuff. So one of the things I love to do with people right away, I don't care how clear they say they are, is I like to have them do a wheel. So I'm sure people have seen this. There's a life coaching wheel. It looks like a circle and it has different pieces of the pie. And each piece indicates an area of your life. So you can have relationships, work, spirituality, family, all of that. So out of all of these areas of your life, I have people rate them on a scale of one to 10. 10 being like, I'm really satisfied with this area. One, I'm not. And um, I kind of, that's my starting point to see like what areas people actually want to improve on. And that's, I always use to help them come up with goals. So I will say like, oh, I see this is the lowest area in your life. And what that tells me is that this is the area of your life that is generating what I call the highest level of catabolic energy in your life. So what that is, is there's two kinds of energy. Um, everybody knows energy exists. This is not weird woo woo stuff. This is science. Everything is made up of energy. So in my work, I'm also teaching about people about the energy that they're generating and bringing into a space. So if you're lower, you're generating more catabolic energy. This is energy that most like to think of as negative. It's energy that's draining. This is probably an area of your life where you have more resistance around. It's probably an area of your life that you're living out of alignment in because going back to the feeling. So I always like to look at what's lowest there. And I say, if we were to move you up two numbers, like you're at a five right now, if I moved you up to a seven, seven, you were like at that level of satisfaction, um, what would need to happen for you? And they would be like, well, I guess like, I don't like, let's say I have a client recently who was like, well, I want to create more passive income. So for me, it would be like with my work, I'm at like a five, but to move up to a seven, I think I would need to have a course out that I created and I could sell it and I say, okay, so that's the have. And then we back it up into, so who do you want to be? You want to be an online course creator. How does an online course creator show up? They create content. Um, they, you know, they share their content. So that means that stuff needs to get in your calendar. And I'd also advise that every morning when you wake up, you tell yourself, I am an online course creator. And therefore you show up that way. So visualization is another tool that you can use, even just seeing yourself, you know, the athletes use this. So going back to, as far as the values, like the different kinds. So the wheel can always help you kind of assess where you are. I think everyone, I'm constantly doing that. Um, it's a great way to, to come up with goals if you feel like you're kind of stuck with goals. Um, but another thing I like to do with these different areas is, um, or another tool next that I work with these areas that I use this tool in conjunction with is a values assessment. So um, this also helps people come up with goals. So when you're clear on, let's say, like family is a huge value of yours. Like you told me, you know, your family is a huge value of yours. On a scale of one to 10, you're telling me this is a 10. Like my family, most important thing to me. And then you said to me, health is important to me. I value that as well, but that's more at probably like an eight. Okay, cool. So when we look at those, when you're waking up in the morning and let's say your family is going to take priority because yeah, you value your health too, but your family is more important to you. So I always like to have people rate. I use, I love using rating systems because it allows people to have awareness. So when they start to rate, I'll say, well, how are you living in alignment with that? So if you tell me your family's at a 10 to you, and then what you do is you show up and work always takes priority over your family. You don't prioritize spending quality time with them. You're living out of alignment. So when people see their values, 
it's huge awareness for them. Like I remember I was working with this guy who he, I used to teach this career transition class and he came through my class three different times repeatedly. And I was like, um, I, he pulled me off the last class he came, he pulled me off to the side and he said, I keep coming to these classes because I'm hoping I can figure this out, but I just feel like something's missing. I feel like I don't, it's not that I don't like my work. He's like, that's the thing is like, I actually love what I do, but I just feel so unfulfilled. So I was like, let's just do a values assessment. Cause what tell me right now is you are feeling this way because you're living out of alignment with some major values of yours. I know that to be true. It's and when people come to me and they're unfulfilled, it's always one of two things. One, you're living out of alignment with your values or two, you're not using your strengths in a way that feels good to you. It's one or the other always. So had this guy do an assessment or the values assessment and he, it came up family, most important thing to me. And I said, okay, it's a 10 for you. How do you feel like you're honoring this? Would you say one to a 10? And he's like, I mean like a two. And I'm like, well, what's that about? And he's like, well, I guess, you know, my work always has me gone. I have a, he's like, I have a, a toddler and I haven't been to any of her birthdays since she was basically when she was, I think he was even deployed when she was gone or something or when she was born. Um, so anyways, he's like that. And then, yeah. And I said, okay, well, this is why you're feeling unfulfilled is because you're not honoring that value of family. So when you make your next decision about the career that you're going to do next, that is your priority. And it changes when you know these values, it changes how you advocate for yourself. It changes how you design your life. And that's why people listening right now, I know you all want that freedom in your life and that you have that value probably around family. Um, around having the freedom to do what you choose. So you really need to consider those values with every single decision that you make when it comes to the work that you do. And you need to advocate to always honor those values um, because a lot of people, they're just letting other people design their life and they're not getting clear about their values and who they want to be. And then they're not intentional and then they're walking around feeling unfulfilled. And that is why. I think there's so much to that a lot of people are, in my experience, looking for someone to tell them what would make them happy. So there's, if you've ever seen the movie Big uh, with, I think it was Big, yeah, is it Big? Maybe it was a different movie. Yeah, no, it was Big. When the uh, Tom Hanks asks the, uh, the, the chauffeur driver, he says, well, what kind of clothes should I wear? And the chauffeur driver stops the thing and pulls up and says, whoa, whoa. Clothes is very sacred to me. Clothes tells you who you are. I can't tell you who you are. And I think a lot of people are, if they're not fulfilled by gosh only knows what definition, because there's, you know, there's very, you know, some people might have mm -hmm. less or, or feel like it's fulfilled or expect less. But I find so many people are looking outside of them and they're seeing somebody else that's doing well and they're saying, okay, that looks fulfilling, but there's a few variables that are different. A simple example in, in our field. There are many people that are, let's say, working 60 hours a week and they are doing awesome things in the field. And, and I've seen some of these people that they're just happy. Now, one variable that I sometimes see is, well, guess what, Wade? They don't have children and, or, and they might be married. But so there's even a different thing. As parents, it takes a good 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week to really be present for your kids, depending on what level you want to be at. And so it's not that these people are higher achievers than the people who happen to have kids. They simply have less things going on. And yet, if you're a person that says, well, wait, I've, you know, you're, if you're measuring yourself against them, and I've done this where, okay, well, I should be doing this and they're doing all those things. And, and again, it's, it, it can be an excuse if you're not careful. So it's not to say if you have children, you can't do great things because you can, you can go down a really not so good spiral and then blame your kids for why you're not where you're at. That's not what I'm talking about. Simply saying, if it takes a certain amount of time, identity to be that father or that parent, let's say just to throw a number on it again, to, to, if it takes 30 hours a week to be the type of parent you want to be, and you're working 40 hours a week, well, that other person can drop 70 hours a week just as easily. And yeah, you know what? If it's high quality work, and of course there's research, we get tired after a certain amount of time and whatnot, but still, if that's that person's main priority and they're also talented, guess what? they're probably going to grow, you know, all things being equal, they're going to grow it at a faster pace in that one dimension of their life of, you know, career, whatever it might be. And I think a lot of people have unrealistic expectations about that. So they're seen outside and it's not necessarily hate. It's not jealousy. It's like, gosh, that person has that. I want that so badly. And yet 
it's not so much that it's unrealistic. It's, it's actually out of alignment with what they truly value. So I'm wondering when you work with people, how often do you find that a person like this uh, person you were just mentioning isn't even really aware that they're out of alignment with their own truest, you know, their own ideals, their own values, what they hold dearest. And when they see that, you know, what does that shift look like? Or is, is that easy for most people? Is it hard for most people to then make that shift? Because now they've got this other identity that there's at least some stock, there's some time into it. There's, hey, you know, I've put energy into this, I've put time into this. You know, how is that that people identify that when you help them? And, and what's that like? What, what's that loss, if you will, the opportunity cost where they say, okay, now I've got a shift? Because that in coaching seems to me one of the things that's toughest is when people realize, okay, I'm going to have to give something up. I can't mm -hmm. do both of these. How does that play out in your experience? Well, so a lot of people are not aware of their values. Um, if you ask people, what are your top values? They'll be like, hmm, what do you mean? And some of the people will be like, I value my family. But they're, a lot of times they're not aware that the way that they're living their life doesn't show that they value their family. And how do you know that someone is in alignment with their values? You can look at how they're spending their time and their money. You can also look at, like, look at their calendar. If you say something is really important to you, you don't spend a lot of time on it. You don't invest in resources in it. It is not important to you. Or you're living out, or you're living out of alignment with that. And we see this a lot with entrepreneurs too, where they'll say like, yeah, my business is important to me, or it's important that I become this kind of person. And some people will have the clarity around saying like, I want to be the entrepreneur that values their family, that is present, that has more time with them, that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to work constantly nonstop. That's like who I want to be. But you'll see that they don't even line their resources up with that. It's like, they think that like, you're going to need to invest in being that person. So that's another way of looking at this too. Living in alignment is like looking at how you use your resources, your time and your money. Um, but going back to as far as I wrote down here, oh, you, what, you, what you're going to be losing in a sense when you change, like when you get this awareness and you're like, whoa, wait, I'm living out of alignment. So what's happening here. So going back to the example I gave earlier, the guy was a pilot and he, um, so he started his career in the military and then he went to um, do pilot stuff with another corporate organization. And anyways, um, so he had this identity that I am a pilot, even subconsciously, maybe not even like he wasn't aware. I'm a pilot who works nonstop. That is who I am. And he behaved that way. A lot of times I shine a light around, this is the identity that you're playing out. And how do I know that? If you're wondering what is happening at the subconscious level, how you can know if your programs are in alignment is it, or what identities you might have because you're not aware is to look at your results. Your results will show you. So because he was working excessively, prioritizing the role of being the pilot, he's identifying as, as that kind of person, right? So now it's, I said, who do you want to be? Now that you're aware that this is something that you really value in your life, um, you're not living in alignment with it. What kind of person do you want to be? And he's like, I want to be the dad that is present, that goes to all of my daughter's birthday parties and is there for all of her fun stuff. And okay, so what do you need to do? Now, if you were that dad that was present, like, how would your work look? What would be different for you? And he's like, well, I guess like what I would need to do is I take on a role that where I was home more. Okay. And he's like, but and the thing that's hard for me is like, I really still love being a pilot. Like I actually, I like it okay, well, you can still be that pilot, but you got to advocate for yourself in a different way. Like maybe you find another organization you work for and you say, hey, I really value family. That's really important to me. So I, I, if I take on this role, then I want to be home this, this much. I've seen so much with career coaching where people feel unfulfilled, but they don't do the work to design the life that they want. They just take life as it is. And I'm a person, and so is my husband. Like, people are like, how do you guys always have so much time off? I have four consulting contracts. I run my own one on like coaching business group and one on one coaching business. And I work with four other different organizations. 
And I have a lot of freedom and flexibility because I've designed my life that way because I was intentional about it. The same thing with my husband. My husband's a dentist, works your typical business hours, except he has an excessive amount of time off where people are like, do you ever work? Because he advocated for that. And every time he takes on a role, he's like, no, I'm not taking on this role unless it honors my schedule. And I can tell you that he has, I don't know any of his friends that have that much flexibility. And I'm telling you the reason why they don't, and they're the same field. The reason why they don't is because they don't advocate for themselves because they're not intentional about designing the life that they want. You have to be intentional about it. If you're not intentional about it, it won't happen. What will happen is you will default to the agenda of everybody else. And when you even take on a new role, like for some of you out there that are listening, you're like, I, I'm fine. Maybe some of you want to stay in the current role that you're in, but you just wish that you had more freedom. You wish that you had the three day weekend. I'm telling you that you can advocate for that. Design your life that way and really think about what brings you joy and what kind of what sh shifts your energy into the states that you want to feel like what makes you feel good. And that's going to have a lot to do with your environment and what's happening around you. And you can be intentional about shaping that. I even bring it back to like when you take on a new job thinking about like the space that you're going to be in. Like if you're going to be working in an office room and you have like, there's no windows, people always complain about being in a space that has no windows. And it's like, shoot, before you take on a job, ask them, what is it going to look like in my office? Advocate for a different kind of office. If you sit there and you tell me you value professional development and growth so much, then I want to see that in your negotiation when you're taking on a new role, you know? That's what I mean about being intentional with your life. Get clear around who you want to be, what kind of lifestyle you want to have, what are your values, and advocate for yourself. Design your life in alignment with that. Yeah, the advocating part is so unbelievably huge. And I don't think there's ever been a time in my lifetime that it's been easier to advocate specifically for whatever a person wants. And it doesn't mean you'll get everything you want. But when you look at the flexibility that's going on now of people getting used to, people working from home, corporations realizing that, you know what, maybe we don't have to have everybody in an office building to get productivity from them. And in fact, maybe that's not the most financially intelligent way because it's costing us so much in overhead. And are we really making that up by having people in, in a space? There's so much going on. And yeah, you have to advocate before. It's almost like any other relationship. It's if you go into a marriage and you're about to get married and person A says, well, part of this agreement is I get to sleep with whoever I want to whenever I want to. And you say yes. And that's not what you want. That probably wasn't a good idea. And that's maybe an extreme example, but people will sign on to jobs and they'll just say, well, that's what they're offering. I said, well, yes. first of uh... all, it doesn't mean they're not yeah, it doesn't mean they're not open to something else. That's just what that's just what's on the menu. So if one of my friends is like, Wade, you you know, you often ask for either what's not on the menu or to to you know specifically put things together. So well, a few reasons. One is because I know what I want and not in some sort of demanding I'm better than you way, mm -hmm. but because I'm gonna ask for it. And if you tell me no, we can't do that, or you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know, fried rice, that the stuff's already mixed together. No way we can't take out the onions because you don't like onions. Okay, hey, it is what it is. But at the same time, why wouldn't I ask for what I really want? Second, I might inspire this other person to realize, oh my gosh, I, we could we could do fried rice without onions. Or when it comes to the employment field, even more importantly, when people say, oh wait, maybe there are other talented people out there. I think of the stay-at-home mom, not so much only with the college degree, but specifically so many stay-at-home moms with advanced degrees mm -hmm. that for so many years remained unemployed while they were raising their children. And it was so many of these companies were binary. It's either you work for us 40 hours a week plus or nothing. And these are some of the most intelligent and powerful women I know. They're committed to family, all the values that you would want in these positions. And all they're saying is, I only want 10 hours a week. In fact, I'd love, please, can I have 10 hours a week? I'm losing my mind, staying home with my kids. But I want that, but my family still comes first, mm -hmm. but I can still do something. And there's like, like you've said, if you, once you're in the job, it's, it's pretty much too late. And it's almost, irre, it, I wouldn't say it's irresponsible, but it's almost not fair to them because they said, no, you told us this is what you wanted. But when you come in and say, Hey, this is what's important to me. And it's not a power dynamic. It's not, a, I'm trying to take advantage of you. It's simply saying for me to be the person that I want to be yes. long-term in this company. And I want, I want to be to this. Let's talk about the pot. I want to be a great pilot with this company for the next 20 years. I know I can't do that though 
60 hours a week, let's say, is the normal shift. I can do that for 30 hours a week. So guess what? I'll be happy. I'll probably go nowhere. And by the way, employee turnover costs a little bit. Yeah, it does. It costs mm-hmm. a truckload. And so I'll be happy. And you know what? There might be other people out there like me who could work the other shift of my thing. And I'm even flexible to what days. You know, it's not, it's not me saying it has to be this way or I won't do it. I can okay. be flexible. You know, that sort of a thing. So wait, I want to touch on that because we all have the power to design our life. And this comes to back to our communication, not only how we communicate with other people, but how we are communicating with ourselves. And um, Wade and I off here, we're talking about NLP, so neuro linguistic programming and how there's people teach this in very different ways. And in a nutshell, how I explain this, and I have training in this, is basically it's about looking at how we're communicating with ourselves and or so our own communication with ourselves and then how this relates to everybody outside of us because it starts in our own mind. So going back to negotiation, because we're always negotiating. We are always intentionally designing our lives or maybe some of us are, we're always designing our lives, maybe not intentionally, but we have the opportunities to. So when you are asking and advocating for the things that you desire, and I think you should always be doing this, even when you go to a restaurant, sometimes people, like you gave that example, like they believe like, I don't want to be that person, but this is the thing. It's your body. It's your body, right? You're going to be putting food into you. into your, So it's like thinking about that with your work. It's like, it's your life. You're the one who has to work there every day. You're the one who's going to feel the impact of that. So anyways, you can come from this place of like, it's, it feels gross when someone comes from this place of like, well, it has to be this way. I want it this way. Why does it feel gross? It's because the energy around it, the way that that person's showing up, it's very ego focused. But when you show up from this higher energetic place and you, and this has to do with your words, because everything has energy. So even the words you use, word choice is very important. It's important in your own mind, the stories that you're telling yourself, but it's also important when you're talking to someone else. So if you come Let's say um, I teach a lot around negotiation and like when someone is negotiating for something, what I always advise is that you approach this from a higher energetic state and you use the words like we, I want it to work best for both of us, not just me. I can show up well when this happens because I can be the best pilot for your company and it can work well for both of us if I show up in a way that really honors my values and the values that are really important to me are my family and think whatever. People, this is what I have found. When you negotiate from this place, no one ever hates on you for saying, I really value this. I want to honor my value. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, you're a crappy person, Wade, because you want to honor your value of, you know, family. No, I don't think that way. So language is very important. So if you know your values, use them when you negotiate for what it is that you desire. And just get curious. When you pro- when you approach a situation from this, this curious place, wonder what could be possible. Stuff gets created in that state. Instead of thinking from the lower level mindset of like, it is just what it is. That's what they offered me. Then that's a limited mindset. That's not you, you not looking for opportunity. I'm telling you right now, there's always opportunity. And it hurts my heart when someone just accepts a role without getting more curious about it, without considering their own values and how they can shape it into being who they want to be. So my sister um, is a nurse and um, she always has people telling her about like, oh, people, you know, nurses experience a lot of burnout and just like making up this story. And yeah, some do experience a lot of burnout, but I always tell her and she's like, I'm just so sick of hearing this. And I said, look, this is your life. You can design it any way that you want. Yeah, some people have had the story that they experience a lot of burnout, but guess what? Those same nurses can change careers. They can find other roles. They can advocate for themselves so that it is more in alignment with who they want to be. And I'm here to say, if you're experiencing burnout, it is because you are not being intentional. Like you're not living in alignment with your values. And that's probably going to require you to have get clear on what those values are and to have some conversation around it. Otherwise, you'll just default into doing what everybody else wants you to do. Yeah, and I think so many people assume that it's a confrontation if you say to an employer, here's what I'd like. Because mm-hmm. again, in the as somebody who's an employer and has been an employer and work with employers, the best situation in general, if I in a generic sense for an employer is to hire somebody, to develop them, and have them stay with you your entire career. 
That's it's just there's less training costs, there's less friction. So when a person comes in and says, "I can commit to 40 hours," but they really are only in it for 20, that's not helping the employer. That's hurting the employer. That's that's holding back, as opposed to saying, "Look, I can give you 20 awesome hours a week. I'm open. I'm flexible within these you know within these time frames. My you know use a, one of the ba- most basic examples for for for." often moms, but sometimes it's dads as well, is to say, hey, my kids are in school. I'll use the United States as an example, 180 days out of the year. I am committed to working five hours a day, those 180 days, because I can help, I can be the parent I need to be for my children. When it's summer, I'm not committed to being there. I'm committed, in fact, I'm committed to being somewhere else. I'm committed to be with my family. And I think that's one of those types of arrangements people are going to see happen more and more. I mean, teachers already have that for the most part. That's the nature of of that job and its schedule other than a couple of days here and there. But it's something that's so clear because as an, as a person who's an entrepreneur and, and hires people at times, I only want your best hours. If you're good for 900 yeah. hours a year, I don't want the other, I don't want to be paying you the other 1100 hours a year that you're going to just, uh, I'm not fully present. I'm, you're, you're almost stealing from me. So again, I'm, and I'm, I'm approaching it from almost a little bit of an intense, the other approach is saying, you're not doing the employer a favor. That's a story to say that, you know, that's inaccurate to say that you're doing the employer a favor yeah. to lie about what you really want. It's no different than lying about a relationship and saying, you know, again, I don't want to be married if if that's your truth that you do, or it's okay if you do these things when it's not. So I think we set ourselves up for that. And we're afraid that maybe someone will tell us no. But when you look at, I mean, there's over seven and a half billion people on the planet. Chances are, somebody's going to say yes. If you look at Indeed or you know any of these job boards, or, there's so many places out there. And if you can look a little further, it's not so much that you have to have people adjust to you. It's just, can you find that person that says, that's what I want. I want somebody who's happy and going to give 30 hours. In fact, you know what? There's, as you and I both know, there's employees who say, I can only afford 10 hours a week of your time. So I'd love you to work 10 hours a week with me. Or like you mentioned, you have four people, that, you know, four groups you're working with. And you know, my guess is, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this, the chances are each one of them, it's working out for them to mm-hmm. have the way you're doing it. And sometimes, not necessarily this is your situation, it can be where the person says, oh, we can't afford, I'll use a, just a random example, but we can't afford a $50,000 CFO, but there's five companies or there's six companies that can afford a $10,000 a year CFO. And now you're making $60,000 and you've got flexibility because you're still, you're, you're looking at your intention, but you're open enough to it looking slightly different than this fixated vision. Yes. That is the key. It's about everything we do. We do it because we think it's going to make us feel a certain way. So I say, if you're going to get attached to anything, get attached to how something makes you feel. And going back to negotiation, we love it. Like from the, on the employer's end, when someone shows up and they're confident in themselves and they know what they want and they, they say, I really value these things. Like we like that. We find that person attractive to like, we, it's somebody we want to bring on our team versus the mindset of someone that, you know how, like I've done a lot of interviews and when I'm like, do you have any questions? And they're like, no, no, I think I got it. I'm good. You don't have any questions. Like you're about to take on a job. You're spending a big chunk of your life here and you don't have any questions. That's alarming to me at my end. And when you, I used to hate this when I was an employer or when I was a manager and I had 25 employees that I supervised. And I remember hiring, I hired a big chunk of them when I came on board. And I remember that not one of them negotiated their salary. And that was hard for me because I was like, I wanted them to, because when it came to HR, like I remember these, these are social workers. So they're master's level social workers. They're making crap for money. And, and though we're, we were a nonprofit, so it's not like we could pay an excessive amount. But I was just amazed that none of them advocated for themselves. And I remember telling our HR department, I was like, okay, we got to pay her more. Like she's worth t- way more to us than, than what she's getting. And she's like, Angela, she accepted that. What do you mean we got to pay her more? She accepted that. So even on my end, I wanted to advocate for her and she didn't. And this, I've seen this play over and over. Like when I took that job, I remember I made over 20 grand more than the person was in the role before me because I simply asked for it. I advocated it. And sometimes think about, come from this mindset of curiosity and opportunity. Like maybe they can't give you additional money because they, you know, like they just don't have it. 
What are some other ways, like what are some other things that they can do that improves your quality of life that will make you feel like you want to feel? So for me, I've advocated for gym memberships. I've advocated, so I came from the nonprofit background and I worked in mental health before I started doing all the entrepreneur stuff. But I advocated for those, yeah, the gym memberships, um, additional time off because I value freedom. I advocated for additional paid time off. Um, courses, I always advocate for personal development. That's a huge one for me. I'm always thinking about like, what else will help me? And plus, it helps me show up more excited about the role too. And and they're happy to invest in me. Like, it's not like they're annoyed with me. Um, and that's the other thing when someone's like, well, I'm afraid that if I negotiate for this role, then um, they're not going to like, they're going to take the job away from me. No, they're not. The worst that they're going to say, they already took all this time to interview you, to get you to this point of offering you a job. You think that they're going to straight up be like, no, I don't want you anymore because you asked for more. They're going to just straight up say, no, we can't do that. But there's, it all comes back to how you word things. And if you're like, I don't want to make them mad. Well, then don't come from a lower level energy and be like, it has to be this way. Think like, I want to be the best employee for you. I want this to be a we win scenario for us. In order for me to show up in my best way, I need to honor my value of family, personal growth. I even say I need to honor my value of um, being intentional with my finances. I used to always negotiate that way. I'd say, hey, me and my husband are really trying to pay off all of our student debt. That's very important to us. We have a big a financial goal um, you know, to pay it off at by this time. In order for us to do that, I would need to make this amount of money. How open would you be to increasing the salary to and I just leave it and a lot and use language is key. You notice I said how open a lot of people don't like to think of themselves as someone that's closed. <laughs> it's just like a psychological thing. So if you even use those words, we honor values, I'm grateful for this opportunity, curious, that stuff, all of those words generate this different kind of energy. You can feel it versus me saying it has to be this way. Even if I just say those words, you feel the difference. And that's why I always encourage people to do is approach, really approach life from this mindset of you're curious and you're looking for opportunity. I'm always looking for opportunity. When people ask me, they're like, are you looking, you're looking for another job? Like what the heck, Angela, you have all these contracts. I'm like, I'm always open for opportunity. I'm curious. And I think that's why like I create the results that I'm proud of is because I show up from this place of curiosity and believing that there's always opportunity that's that's so important and and you know a lot of the times when i work with people in sales coach and i say look it's not that there's a formula to getting a person to say yes but there's a lot of things you can say that will definitely make them say no yeah and you know us versus them or me versus mm -hmm. you sets that up in in such a different way and i really love your point about just really communicating your values because some people will say, if you're in the wrong place and you say, I value family, this, that, and the other, and if they truly value that you work 80 hours a week and don't whine, they'll say, no, well, sorry, you're, you're really, you're in the wrong place and yeah. you're doing them a favor and you're actually saving yourself a lot of heartache. You're just, you're just nipping it in the bud big time versus if you say, this is what's important to me and you're giving that person, this is one of the most important things I think. And this is, in my experience, depending on how you do it, can be an attempted ma manipulation, which will very often backfire on you because people people can read people. Mm -hmm. Or if you generally come from a space of, you know what? Like you said, are you open? Have you considered? What you're basically doing is you're respectfully saying you have the power, so it's it's up to you. But have you, have you thought about it? Have you all discussed? Because in my situation, I can speak for me, a survey of one, this would be that game changer for me. Like you said, what's negotiating the time off? There's these different things. And so often, if you just say, well, hey, you know what, we can't, you know, we can't pay you that amount. Okay, well then I know I can get the job done in four days instead of five. How about we see if you can, again, looking out for them like an economic adult, yeah. what are the criteria that you need done? What does a person get done in five days? Let's say, I'm just gonna say widgets or tasks. They do five tasks in five days. I'm gonna say, great, if I can get these five tasks done in four days, because I'm gonna commit to you that I'll work four days. If I only get four tasks done in those four days, pay me based off of four days. But if I get that fifth task done or even better, what about this? If I get six tasks done, can we forget about how many days I work and can you just pay me for five days worth? So now you're gaining something. You're getting a 20% more. You're getting six tasks instead of five. 
I'm getting something. I'm working four days instead of five. And we're now more setting up a result situation. And again, so much of this. It's that we want the we win mindset that will always serve you. And a lot of times there's creative things that you can do, like even in your own situation around like, if you're like, oh, it would really be nice to make more money. Well, you can even look at how you've been spending money. So like an example that I give, I've seen this with my clients where like they pay a lot for daycare. And I'm like, think about it this way. If you worked only four days a week, that's one day of daycare that you don't have to pay for. And that can save you money there. And then also, if we advocated for you to work from home, we can save money on gas. Oh, like you, you don't take on, like, let's say someone's taking on a new role and they're offered all these health benefits and the company is like, well, no, I can't give you more. We, we offer all these benefits. And you could even say like, well, I don't need those health benefits because maybe your spouse holds health benefits for you. And then even just showing them how like, well, this benefits you because you don't have to pay me these health benefits and just always be thinking about how it could work best for both of you. Because even like going back to the days, like if you worked one day less, you could save money, let's say on daycare. Um, but you could also say that like, for some reason, this benefits the company because even like another way of negotiating is to ask if that if they would be open to seeing how this would work out. Like, let's say... Um, some people who want more freedom or they just really want to work from home, I will always ask them to have a conversation with their supervisor around trying it out. And there's not much risk there. You say like, could we just try it out? Like, let's try it out for a couple of weeks. We'll see how it goes. If you think that it is not working out, then we can just remove that. We don't need to be doing that. Then people are more willing to work with you. If you say things like that, if you consider them, because this is the point, like I'm considering that person, like I'm considering that they feel like this is a risk. They haven't tried this. They're a little afraid about it. So it's coming in with this mindset of both of you. When you come in with all about me, when you even just approach life like this in general, I mean, I talk a lot and I teach a lot about energy, how everything is energy. And I really do teach it from this place of this is science. I'm not out here being like, I don't know, like super woo where you're like, I can't even listen to this girl. This is ridiculous. No, like you get these concepts because you know how it feels. Like you know how it feels to be around someone who's all about me, 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 right? And we know what it feels like to be around someone that's super negative, drains our energy. We know what it feels like to be around someone that uplifts us, that feels good to be around them. So this energy is being created from how this person is showing up, like what they're thinking in their own minds, because we can feel that intention and also their word choice because words have energy too. So be really intentional about even the words that you're using, the words that you're saying to yourself, the words that you're saying to other people. There's so much to talk about when we talk about being intentional, but it's really about thinking about, are you showing up in a way that is in alignment with who you want to be? Are you proud of how you're showing up? That's one of my favorite questions to ask someone is what would make you proud of how you showed up? And even when people feel the fear, like maybe they don't want to negotiate since we've been using this example, I would say, what would make you proud of how you showed up? Would it make you proud that you never even tried, that you didn't even ask? No, what would make you proud is that you at least asked. Worst case scenario, they say no, and you're in the same situation you are in now. I just had a client where I had, um, she took on this job. And she was like, okay, they offered me the role. So I just send them back and say yes. And I was like, well, aren't you going to negotiate and like ask for something back? And she was like, I don't know. Like, what would I even ask? And I helped her around like the dollar amount. I always like to advise people to ask for 10 grand more. And what happens, this is what I usually see happens is like they do the little wiggle thing in between and they end up minimum with five grand more. I recently helped a client get 15 grand more and um, a 5,000 stipend for a personal development. It was all based on how we worded it. And they were like jumping up and down because they were sitting there ready to hit the button and say, I accept. And that person just within five minutes of talking to me and us talking about how they're gonna be intentional with their words. And it always, I'm telling you, it always goes back to their values. I never negotiate without talking about values. And if you don't know your values, you're listening right now and you don't know your values, I highly recommend that you get some words to describe your values. And you can be as simple as like if you Googled values assessment, there'll be tons of words that pop up and you don't even need to take like a quiz. It's just a matter of looking at words, pick the words that resonate most with you. The words are 
the definitions can be yours. It doesn't like what family means to me is going to be completely different to what it means to Wei, right? Or you or anybody else. So all that is important that you know what it means to you and then pick your top five words for things that are really important to you and see like, am I living in alignment with these values? If I say it's a 10 for me, am I acting like it's a 10 for me? And if the answer is no, how can we move that up the way that you're showing up? How can we show up more in alignment with those values? When you start to do that, you will design a life that you're really proud of. And that is the only way is by knowing those values and shifting things in a way that honors those values. Wow. This has been so awesome. There's so much uh, to what we've gone over here. And so much of it is about, as we discussed, you know, being intentional, being clear. You'd mentioned that there's a values assessment you have, and we'll put that link in the uh, in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, you can get them in the show notes. If you're watching this, uh, you'll, you'll see it below. Um, what would be your final thoughts to somebody who's just not certain if they could even do this? What's the first step? How does somebody start? Is it the values assessment? Is it that they just start thinking about what they'd most like to see happen to be different? Is it the wheel? Um, how do you suggest somebody start if they're not certain? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I don't think you can go wrong with starting with either or the values or the wheel, because even with the wheel, if you started with the wheel, um, you're going to see how things, and don't be mean to yourself about it. Just look at it and say, scale of one to 10, how do I feel about this area of my life? And if it's lower, that's okay, because that's an opportunity for you to shift in that area. But usually if it's lower, I'm telling you it is lower because there's some value of yours related to that area of your life that isn't being honored. So I would recommend actually to do them both because either way, they both relate to each other. Awesome. Thank you so much. Where can people find out about your work? So you can find my work um, over at, my podcast is called Intentional Mind Podcast. My website is intentionalmindpodcast.com. And then Instagram, I'm on there as Ange Barnard. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights, your passion. There's there's so much I think people can take out of this. And to be really clear, just to remind people, you don't necessarily have to get a coaching session with somebody to make changes. You can listen to what we talked about today, yeah. apply it. it. It's so much nicer. I can't talk to everybody in the planet any more than you can. So uh, it's not cheating if you take these ideas and use them and apply them and make, make some more money. Uh, that's Definitely. always awesome. <laughs> Thanks so, so much, Wayne. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate your energy. Um, and to everybody in the audience, as always, look forward to helping you help more people and make more money in less time. Do what you do best so you can better enjoy your family, your friends, and your life. Thank you.